Good evening to you. Hope you've had a real nice afternoon. I'd like for us to study again. That's another part of God's Word tonight. Uh, we all are acquainted with the concept of judgment in the Scripture, but there are differing aspects of that, different ways that the Bible talks about judgment, and some things that we might even want to think about uh, this evening, some things that might help us to understand a little bit better uh, what God is talking about in different aspects of that. I think you'll see that as I go through and, and we discuss it this evening. I'm going to deal with five different things, five different ways that God speaks of judgment in the Scripture. And I want to start with the fact that before we do any other understanding of judgment, we all understand God's going to be the judge and all of that in the end, in the final day. But did you know that one of the things the scripture emphasizes is the idea that we need, before that time ever comes, we need to judge our own selves and be aware of the fact of where we stand in God's sight. We're called upon to be a judge ourselves. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this actually is in connection with the Lord's Supper, uh, in our partaking of it, and that, that's a weekly observance that we do, and he says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now when he says that, he's telling you something there that implies you have to take a look at you. And, and most of what he has to say there may have more to do with just the way that you observe the Lord's Supper and examining yourself properly about that. But you know, before we eat the Lord's Supper, uh, we all want to come to it in a worthy fashion. And we don't want to be hypocrites and partake of the Lord's Supper and, and remember his death all the while rebelling against him in our hearts. So we want to come to the Lord's Supper having examined ourselves and make certain that we're worthy to eat of it and also that we're going to eat and partake of it the right way. Uh, another time, Paul said and told the Corinthians this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, he said, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you're disqualified? Think about what he's saying there. He's asking us as Christians, he's writing to Christians, he's asking us as Christians to take a good look at ourselves and, and ask ourselves, are we really in the faith? Are we really walking in the ways that keep us in the light, keep us in the faith, and that we are really what we should be in God's sight. Examine yourself, test yourself, judge yourself in this regard. And it would be better for us to judge our own selves than it would be for us to get to the end and know that God will judge us and find that we've not done what's right. How do I know that? Because that's what the scripture teaches. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31 and 32. Paul writes to the, them again and he says, If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world in the course of our life. We may have to face chastening at time from the Lord, correction from the Lord, correction through his word. And know that that has to change about our conduct. But wouldn't it be better if we would judge ourselves? If we would look at ourselves all the time. Now here's the problem. We live in an age where we're taught not to believe that. We live in an age where it's left the impression that you don't want to think badly of yourself or you, you don't you know, want to feel bad about yourself. You want to always feel good about yourself. And I hate it, but you know what? That's just not realistic as a Christian. I understand that we don't need to constantly put ourselves down and you know, say, oh, I'm ugly, or this or that about ourselves. But the truth about it is, we need to be realistic about where we stand with God. And if we're going to sit back and say, oh, I don't want to hear any negative thing about me, I don't ever want to think any negative thing about me, that's just not going to work. We're going to have to open the book and look at ourselves reflected in it and see, am I living up to God's standard? God expects that of us. It's not even a matter of doubting God or our relationship with God, it's a matter of, it, it's, it's reasonable. It would be like, you know, uh, it would be like a pilot flying his airplane and, and thinking, I, I'm pretty sure I'm on the right course, but I'm not going to check in. I'm not going to 
I'm not going to call in and find out. I'm not going to look at the instrumentation. I'm just going to keep going. That's not wise. A, a good check of what you're doing is good reassurance that you're on the right course and does any correction need to be made. And that's what Paul is really asking us to do. Judge yourself. Now, here's something it said by John, 1 John chapter 3. He says in verses 19 through 21, By this we know that we're of the truth. And that's something we all ought to be concerned about. How do I know I'm walking by the truth? How do I know that I've done what's right? By this we know that we're of the truth. And in the context, he's talking about if we're keeping God's law, if we're doing what he expects us to do, then we can have that. And that way we'll assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. This is a good principle, and it works both ways. He says the ultimate judge of you is God, and that's to be understood. Our hearts, as we know, on the basis of our conscience, either say we're right or we're wrong. In our conscience that God gave us and meant for it to be used, but our conscience is there, and our conscience speaks about our conduct sometimes. And our conscience sometimes make us, makes us feel guilty when we've done something. And other times we may do something and, and maybe somebody else didn't like that, but in our hearts we knew we did the right thing and therefore your heart reassures you. Your conscience says, no, you did act by the standards you knew were the right thing to do. But there's one fact about that we have to keep in mind and that is whether your heart condemns you or assures you that God is greater than your heart. God's standard is higher than our heart's standard. And that's important to remember because I may think I'm right and I may be badly wrong. And we have several examples of that in Scripture, but the Saul of Tarsus was one of the supreme ones. He acted with a completely guilt free conscience, believing that he was doing right by God in doing what he was doing, but he wasn't. He was working against the cause of Christ. He was kicking against it, fighting it. And when Jesus himself came and intervened and let that be known to him, he realized how wrong he'd really been. Conscience may have told him he was right. So it, it's good. We don't want our hearts to condemn us, of course, but it's even better to have a right conscience before Almighty God. So first principle, Let's do a lot of judging of ourselves, not in some superficial way and not in ways that don't matter. Let's judge about where we stand with God. And I really think it probably wouldn't hurt to do that every single day. Look at your life, look at what you're doing, look at your attitudes, and make sure what we're doing is right. Now let's, let's, let's look at a second thing. And that's where the scripture tells us that there is judging that has to go on and it's our responsibility as fellow Christians. Now, probably you're quite aware of these texts in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You may think, no, it's not anybody's business what I do. It's not anybody's, uh, I, I do my thing and, and how I live is my own business and all of that. Nobody ought to be concerned about that. Yet there was a man at Corinth, and at Corinth, a pretty wicked situation already, but at Corinth there was this fella, and and how the scripture describes it was, he had his father's wife. Now, fundamentally, this comes under the category of uh, illicit sexual activity, and therefore he was guilty of fornication as a general term. That's what's wrong. We don't know every detail. We don't know if he took his father's wife away from his father or, or what happened, but Paul said it was such a terrible thing that it was not even commonly done among the Gentiles that even they would have thought that was wrong. So it was a, a very, very terrible thing going on in the congregation there and, a, and it should have been a terrible embarrassment to them. Paul said that they were puffed up instead of being embarrassed about it. But here's what he said they had to do. He said, for I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present. Him who has done so him who has so done this deed. You understand, Paul, he says, I have made a judgment as if I were there. The guilt is, it's the end of the story. In other words, it's not 
a man has done something wrong and now we're going to sit around and judging whether I like that or not. That's not what this is about. The judgment is about de dealing with this man on the basis of his sin. In other words, this isn't a trial to find out if he's guilty. It's already been shown he's guilty. It's understood that he's guilty. But Paul said, I judge him. So there is some judging we have to do as, as Christians. And so he tells them, I have already done this, even though I'm not there, I, I and my spirit have done that. But in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, and when he's talking about power, he's not talking about some supernatural power. The word power is really the word authority quite often when he uses that. So he's saying, in other words, you have Christ's authority to do this. So you gather together, and you will know that my spirit will be with you in this, that as I'm 100% I'm behind you in doing this, deliver this one to Satan. That is, understand, you, know, you grasp the fact that we don't literally take anybody out of God's good grace and put him into the devil's good graces. I mean, that's, that's not possible. That's not even within our framework. He's using this terminology to say, let's recognize that this man is now in Satan's territory. You are delivering him over to Satan in the sense that you're making it clear both to him if he's there and the congregation that he is no longer in fellowship with the Lord and we're no longer in fellowship with him because of that. And we hope that he will wake up and that he will be saved before it's everlastingly too late. That's what we're hoping. We're not doing it because we despise him or, or hate him or, or think necessarily we're all perfect and that he is the only one guilty in our midst. No, Corinth was not a perfect church at all. Matter of fact, it's one of the churches that was most riddled with problems. But, you know, Paul did not say to the Corinthian church, you can't take this action because you aren't perfect. He said to take this action in spite of the fact that everything at Corinth is not all it should be, but this is something far beyond that. It's something that needs to be dealt with. And he said it has to be judged. It has to be decided about. Actions have to be taken in this regard. Now there's kind of a, a companion passage to this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 where Paul says, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which goes hand in hand with what he said before, in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of also indicates authority, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Now, here is a comment that I've heard before when such events take place and, and this has to be done. Inevitably, this happens for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons it happens most frequently about is people quit attending and worshiping with the church any longer. Now, they break their ties with us. They may not formally declare it, but they don't worship anymore. They don't do what God commands, and they go on in that activity. This is not just once they messed up, in other words, or, or, or you know, failed in their human nature to do all they should have done. This is an open choice of rebellion against doing what the Lord says, and they are continuing on in their sin, and it's going on and on and on. This is the situation this person is now in. They've broken their ties in that particular instance. Or it may be out of, uh, of, uh, of ongoing sin in their life, like Paul was dealing with back there in, in 1 Corinthians 5. Whatever the case, now they walk disorderly. And it says that we are to withdraw ourselves. We are to understand that we are no longer in fellowship with that activity. We're no longer in fellowship with that person because of this. But what I was going to say a minute ago, one of the comments I've heard by those that, you know, have gone on and on and on in that state, and then finally, you know, you, you, you confront them about it, and you deal with it, and, and they, they look at you and say, oh, you're kicking us out of the church. Now look, brethren, that, that's ridiculous. Number one, you decided not to be faithful and attend the worship services or to get involved in some heinous sin of some type that's broken fellowship. You decide. We didn't decide that for you. That's the choice you made. And then we admonished and we pled 
And you don't know how many people we deal with that won't even answer a letter, won't answer a phone call, won't acknowledge that you're trying to even get a hold of them, won't come to the door if you come to their house in that situation. And then they say, oh, you're kicking us out of the church. Look, that's foolishness. They are getting removed, and it's a formal declaration of what they've already chosen. And it is they chose not to walk in an orderly way. They chose to, they have failed in their responsibility. They have chosen a life that goes away from the discipline of the Lord. I, I've been told and heard over the years, nothing I've ever exactly researched myself, but that the walking disorderly described a, a marching of soldiers. And I used to be in, in band in high school and all of that, but if you marched, you marched in line. And your band director didn't like it all if you got out of step or got out of line or you turned at the wrong time or whatever. Now, that might happen due to human frailty and all of that, just, you know, poor abilities or whatever. And, and I wouldn't tell you it never happened to me. But it happened to a lot of people that were marching at times. But what we're talking about here is, here is somebody that's broken away from the march and they're, they're going their own track out there. They're walking disorderly. They're not walking with the rest any longer, whether it's through sin or whatever. Now something has to be done, and it says withdraw yourself from them. And so here's the situation we're dealing with. Now, what a lot of people also, another thing I've heard when this is all brought up, the Bible says, somebody will say, not to judge people. Now, Paul just got through saying, I judged this man at Corinth, and yet they somehow or another remember it's, you know, I've, I've decided that judge not and God so loved the world as the two scriptures everybody seems to know and then they don't know anything else about the Bible, but they know those two passages. But we need to learn a little bit more about what God is teaching. There are some judgments we cannot make and that we have to be careful about making and, and, and let me deal with those real quickly. There are judgments to be avoided. For instance, we are not to judge with partiality. We're not to say, okay, I'm going to pick on you, but you I'll leave alone. We are not to use that kind of judgment because we know in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In other words, you've picked out and you're showing partiality about it. Uh, it might be a partiality of favoritism, or it might be a partiality, I'm going to condemn you, but I'm not going to condemn this over here, even though it's the exact same thing. And so we're showing partiality. We can be guilty of that because sometimes we don't think carefully across the board. In other words, are we dealing evenly and open, you know, in a, in a non-partial way about this? That doesn't mean that you can be all right just because uh, somebody else has been treated a certain way. It just means that we need to, to be respectful about that rule. Jesus said something else. He said, we have to be real careful about judging on strictly the basis of appearance. You, you have to be careful about making a judgment outwardly. Uh, you have to instead judge righteous judgment. You, it's kind of like the old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't always know the conditions of a person's heart by exactly how they dress or exactly the style they wear the hair or whatever. You have to be a little careful about that. And if you look at the last part of that, you see the fact he commands us to judge, but just judge using righteous judgment. In other words, be careful how you judge. Judge in a good way, not with a bad way. Don't, you know, don't, don't judge, for instance, uh, every poor person out there. Don't judge, well, they're probably some criminal element. Well, that, that's wrong. That, that's not a fair judgment just because somebody may not have as much money as you do or I do or whatever. Be a little bit careful about that or real careful about that kind of judging. Don't judge just by appearance. Judge with righteous judgment. You know, uh, Samuel and, uh, and Jesse and all, uh, all of David's brothers were gathered together and they're trying to decide who is the next king because God had revealed to Samuel that the king was going to be one of those that were out of David's house, out of Jesse's house. And they went down the list. Well, a lot of those brothers were out there, and they'd been fighting battles, and they were famous soldiers and all of that. And so he's going down the line looking at all these men and older boys and, you know, strong men that had been in, in the battle and everything, 
And, and Samuel's thinking, okay, it's got to be one of these. But they went through every one of those guys and still wasn't there. And, and Samuel said, well, do you have any other sons? Jesse, do you have any other sons? And he said, well, David, he's the youngest. He's out keeping the flock. So they called David in, and the Lord told Samuel, he said, now be careful. He says, the Lord looks not as man looks, but the Lord judges the heart. So you see, the Lord knew things there that they didn't. You can't always judge everything on the basis of just appearance. You have to be careful about that, don't you? Okay, there is also a condemnation that we have to avoid any judging wherein we are engaged in that evil, that wrong. In other words, this is where it comes into play. Don't judge if you're just as guilty of that action yourself and have not repented of it, but you're going on in that sin. You have no right to judge another, and you have certainly no right when your sins are even worse than that. Now, he says over here in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore you are without excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that you would judge another, you condemn yourself. For you judge, uh, for you who judge practice the same things. It's explained in that context. Paul says, you say somebody's guilty of adultery, do you commit adultery? If you're committing it, you don't have any right to be judging somebody and say, well, you're wrong for doing that. It's wrong but you ought not to be the spokesman for it because you're just as guilty of it. I sometimes wonder if when they brought that woman and threw her down in the, in the room and, and, and she was weeping and everything, they said this woman's caught in adultery, and Jesus told them, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. If you didn't kind of make it clear in their hearts to a lot of them, hey, You've been guilty of this. You're, you're going to execute her, but have you been guilty of this before too? Haven't you done something like this? So the point is, we don't have any right to condemn if that's the case. Look at this. Jesus said hypocrites. Now, this is in the you know, judge not context there in Matthew 7. But he says, hypocrites, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You remember that illustration. And, and why would I, if I've got this big old bean coming out of my eye, why would I think I need to come over there to you and pick a speck out of your eye? I've got stuff I need to settle before that takes place. So you see why Jesus taught us not to judge from a hypocritical standpoint. He wants us to be careful about that, and he's cautioning us that we better get our own house in order. And you know when the Bible talks, for instance, to us and says, that we ought to go restore someone. But did you ever notice he said you go if you're spiritual? But if you're worldly and ungodly, you don't need to be going and, and helping somebody be restored. You need to clean up yourself, and then you can go. This says you get that beam out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly about taking the speck out of somebody else's eye. And that's something always to remember. There are other things we cannot judge. You, you cannot judge motive. That is, you can't judge there are things that are solely of the heart that men cannot see. Uh, Paul warned that we must judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. I want to tell you something. Sometimes there will be things that are hidden. There are things we, we cannot know for sure about. So I've heard some brethren before, well, I suspect they're guilty, of that, so just go ahead and do something about it. Well, you don't do that. If you don't know, if, you, if it cannot be proven, it can't be shown to be true, then you don't have any right to act on that. There will, and, and you don't know what's in people's hearts. You can never be sure about that. And so we have to be careful about that. There are also other things. There are personal liberties that we have. Now, I'm not talking about sinful things and things we ought not to be doing in the first place. But the Bible speaks of personal things that we might do. Now, look at what it says. It tells us, let not him who eats despise him. It's talking about the eating of certain meats. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. And he made clear in that context that 
truthfully, eating a piece of meat or not eating a piece of meat is not going to save you or and certainly not going to condemn you before God. Neither one is true. But if you choose not to do something and God doesn't care about all of that, then we don't have any business deciding that for other people. That's their business. They will do as they see fit and God will hopefully bless them if they have the right attitude. But you see how he tells both parties, he says, quit being at each other's throats about things that have to be decided in a personal individual level rather than having anything to do so much with the truth or with something that matters anything in regard to that. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 29, why is my liberty, what, whatever Paul had the right to do in that regard, why is that being judged by another man's conscience? That is, if God has made it right or acceptable, then I, that's not anybody else's business. It's not anybody else's decision. And there is one other type of judging that, that the Bible speaks of. And this kind of judging is not me trying to go or you trying to go help somebody who, who's in sin or needs to be straightened out. It's talking about their speaking evil of another. Going around, rattling off about somebody, bad-mouthing them, spreading the news and spreading their sin before the eyes of everyone to make sure that everybody knows about it. He says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, in other words, in that way, speaks evil of the law and judges the law. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of it. You've decided, in other words, what part of the law you will and won't keep. You've become a judge of God's business, and that's always wrong. So those are some cases that the Bible really does say, I guess you might say, judge not. But there's some other cases where we are told to judge, and we have to fulfill our responsibilities and not shirk them, because we're misapplying certain passages. Well, let's face another uh, sense of judgment, and that is we are judged by the world. There's no two ways about it. When we do what we do as Christians, we are judged by the world. Now, Jesus talks about this, and let's look over here. He, you know, he was judged by the world. We read over here in Luke chapter 7, verse 31 through 34. Let's read that together. It says, the Lord said, to what will I liken this men of this gener the men of this generation? Well, what are they like? They are children, they're like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We, we mourned to you, but you didn't weep. Now, it's a little hard sometimes for some people to understand what he's talking about there. Keep in mind, first off, he's talking about playing. He's talking about a bunch of children playing, doing things playing. You know, my kids uh, played church, and our grandkids played church sometime. And we don't, you know, when we come up here, we're not here to play. But in their minds, they're doing it. I've had kids come home. You teachers, you all know, kids come home sometimes and want to play school. And uh, it wasn't ever one of my favorite games because I wasn't too happy about being there in the first place. But that was the last thing I wanted to do when I came home was play more school. But I remember kids doing that. I remember seeing kids and grandkids say, well, let's do school. Well, what he's saying is, you seem to think that all of this is a big game, Jesus says. He says, of course, nobody ever literally played the flute and said, dance, Jesus. He's saying, you, you're like children, and you say, well, I played you a song. Get up and do a little dance for me. Or I... I, I acted like I was a mourner and you didn't weep along with me. You didn't play our funeral game. And he says, you know what? You're missing the whole point about why I'm here. Now let, let's look again. He says, John the Baptist came and he didn't eat any bread or drink any wine. That doesn't even imply alcoholic wine. It's just talking about he didn't do anything like that. And some of you said, I think that fellow must have a demon of some kind. And you judged him rather than listening to him. And then he said, now I've come, the Son of Man has come, and, and I get out there and I visit with people and I eat and drink, and, and, and you sit back and you say, well, look there, he's a glutton and a wine bibber and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus' whole point about all of this is, did you ever realize that you're not the judge of me? You can judge, I mean, you're going to do it. But do you ever think, 
Did you ever just stop to think how ridiculous that is? Jesus is their king. Jesus is their Messiah. And they're out there, well, I don't quite like how he did this or that. I'm not sure about this or that. And you know what they should have been doing the whole time? They should have been getting at his feet and saying, Lord, teach us how we ought to be acting. But they're letting, they've decided they're the judges of the Lord, in other words. And they were the judges of John the Baptist and this and that. Well, what I want to tell you about that is, we're always going to be judged by the world. And they're probably always going to be about wrong about us. Paul was judged by the world. He talked about it in, in, and, uh, in Acts 24, verses 4 through 6. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us, for we have found this man a plague. Now this is what his enemy said about Paul. Paul is a plague, a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple. We seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. Well, they're just about wrong on every aspect of that. They judged, and we have to be prepared for the fact we will be judged too. We will be judged by the world. They will take a look at us. Now, Paul kind of acknowledged this. We studied this not all that long ago in our Bible classes, but he said, I understand. He said, when we go out here and do our work, preaching and teaching God's word, he said, to some people we're the aroma of death and to some people we're the aroma of life. Some people, you know, smell what we are. Of course, he doesn't literally mean that. See what we are, and they think, bleh. Smells like a garbage can. And to some people, it's the aroma of salvation that leads to eternal life. Some people have understood what this is all about, and they see the glory of it and the beauty of it and all of that, and some people miss it all together. So Paul was judged by the world. And all of us will be judged by the world. The church was judged by the world. Jesus acknowledged, blessed are they, when men hate you and when they exclude you and reviled you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. He just acknowledged that those kind of things are going to happen because you are a Christian. And as members of the Lord's church, sometimes this happens. We do get spoken against sometimes. We do get made fun of for what we stand for and all of that. Uh, they'll say things like, oh, they, that, that's the group that thinks they're the only ones going to heaven. Or they'll say, this, is, this isn't as common as it used to be, but in years gone by, our forefathers, they'd say, oh, they're just a bunch of Campbellites. They, they follow Alexander Campbell, which, you know, was an early leader in restoring the church, but was never, nobody ever wanted. You know, the fact is, we never wanted to be Campbellites. Nobody ever wanted to call ourselves by a man's name. That's where we're different from the denomination. <coughs> and even Alexander Campbell, he didn't want anybody being called by his name. Some people say you're a cult or a borderline cult or something like that. They say, well, you're just too narrow-minded. You don't accept things like everybody else does in the world, which in that case, I think that's about nearly a compliment. Uh, another says, well, you don't, Church Christ doesn't believe in grace. They don't think anything's about grace. Well, all of that's untrue and misleads people about what we stand for. And these are things that may be said. Uh, they're hurtful things, and they're things that are said in such a way as to turn people away and say, oh, you know, to, ought not to listen to them. This was sad. I don't know if you ever saw this. It's been a number of years ago. But uh, this lady on CNN was interviewing uh, a fellow during this time, a, a Baptist pastor. Now, I'm bringing this up because I want to give a balance because here's, here's the thing. We all understand, as members of the Lord's Church, that there have been times when certain people have said certain things that may have not been said the best way in order to try to, you know, reach them and teach them. In other words, we pretty well just made them immediately mad instead of, you know, trying to reason with them and, and deal rightfully. But what I want you to see is there's people that do this about us and try to misrepresent us. Now, here is a case, and I'm not going to go into all the case behind it, but uh, she's interviewing this, this, this Baptist minister. And she said, well, I've been researching the Church of Christ, and 
I don't know much about it. What can you tell me? Now, he, again, he's a Baptist, in other words, saying all these things. Well, this so-called pastor, he said, well, what, the Church of Christ is a new church. It got started about 150 years ago by Alexander Campbell. See my point? And, and it's unfortunately a very legalistic sect, and they tend to use methods of intimidation and pressure tactics, and they claim they're the only ones going to heaven, and all other people are condemned to hell. Uh, so in case, and, and the topic goes on, and she laughs and said, oh, oh, I guess we're in trouble now. And he said, well, no, wait a minute. What more can you tell me about them? And so, well, they claim if you're not baptized by one of their ministers that you're doomed to hell, even if you're a believer in Christ, which, of course, breaks completely with the traditional Christian view that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved because we're saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus who died for our sins and rose again. Uh, for the Church of Christ, folks, that's not enough. You have to be a member of their narrow sect. It's a very exclusive group, and if you're not a member of their sect, you're condemned. Uh, so he said, Pastor, you keep calling them a sect. You, you make it kind of sound like they're a cult. And he says, well, it's kind of a borderline cult. Uh, I don't want to make out it that's kind of like a Hare Krishna group, but it has cult-like characteristics, okay? <laughs> so he got on national TV and he did a job on us, all right? I want you to see, you say, well, there has been people in the Lord's church that haven't talked very nicely about others. That may be. Haven't you always used good sense? But did you think that was real good, kind words there? Do you see that love everywhere in what he's saying? In other words, he's doing everything he can to make us look as horrible as he knows how to make us look. He's skewing it. Now, there are some things that he says that have an element of truth, but he skewed it to make it sound as if, in other words, it's not because of the truth. It's just because we've got these little narrow ways in all of our ways. That, that's what I'm talking about. And you have to think about that. Well, I'm going to move on from that, but let's, let's think about this now. The church was judged. Look at this on Acts 28, verse 22. Paul finally got to Rome. All of Acts, you know, latter half of it, good bit of it, it's him trying to get to Rome, getting arrested and all of that. But he says that when he arrived, the people said, we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it's everywhere spoken against. So, I, you know, I guess I'm thinking, is anything really new? In that century, everybody said, you don't want to get involved with them. And there we had a bunch of information up there just a minute ago of a guy said, oh, no, please don't get involved with them. They're almost a cult. It's everywhere spoken against. I'm just telling you, get used to that because that's the way it is. When you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, this will be your lot. People will not like it. Okay? The flip side is that we have a judging to do as well. Now, in one sense, we're not judging the world in the sense that, like we do within our own fellowship and, and, and our responsibilities there. And Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 5, but he does say this, Do you not know that saints will judge the world? And, and if the world will be judged by you, aren't you worthy to judge the smallest matters? The point is, there is some sense, and, and perhaps God alone knows what all that will be, in which saints, God, people of God, will be a part of judging the world. Now, I've got an opinion about this, and I may be wrong, but I think it is what was said about Noah, because it says in Hebrews eleven seven, by faith, Noah, being warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He condemned the world. I don't know if Noah stood out there all the time telling everybody they were sinful, but I do know that what Noah was doing certainly showed condemnation upon the world because he said it's coming. The flood was coming. And that God had told him to prepare the ark. And that doing what God expected him to do made a certain amount of condemnation of the world. And I think that's a lot of times the case. We judge even when we're not trying to judge. We judge by our example. We show that things are wrong. 
You know, when somebody kind of bullies you and says, oh, why won't you participate in this? Why won't you do this? Why won't you go along with this and this? And we say, I don't believe that's right. And then they come back with some snide remark or make fun of you about it. What the real truth about it is, is that your conduct just judged them. You said, I don't participate. And they don't like it because you won't participate in it. And Peter says it's the same way back in his time. He said, when you live the Christian life, they'll be surprised that you won't run with them in their excesses. But he said, you'll be doing the right things to stay faithful to God. One last thing, and the lesson is yours, and it's the judgment that I think we're most of all familiar with, and that is there'll be a judgment day. There'll be a final judgment. But this is the most important judgment of all. And, and all other judgments kind of kind of pale in comparison because I don't much care if the world judges that they don't like what I do as a Christian. That's fine. That's their business. And if they don't like it, they don't have to do it. But it will matter in the last day when God judges. And we will be vindicated in the last day when God judges that we've made the right decision and that we've lived our lives the right way and that we were wise to have lived our lives that way. We will all appear before his judgment seat. You know, we read earlier, listen, that we ought to judge ourselves. I want to judge myself so I don't have to appear before. I, I mean, we're going to appear, but I don't have to find condemnation in that day. Let's judge ourselves now so that God won't have to judge us as being guilty of anything in that day. Well, let's look at a, a couple of passages and the lesson will be yours. And that is here from 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We, Paul writes to Christians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body. According to what, he, what, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, we will be judged. It will be obvious in that day where we really stood. We'll all face this. Of course the world will face this, and of course sinners will face that. We have to face that too. And that's why we want to do right now and live right now and act in a way that that day we'll be ready for. It. Get our hearts prepared for that day. I think as Christians, the point is, we're always living with a view towards that day. We'll all appear. Let's go to one more passage, and then the lesson's yours. Hebrews 10, 30. We all know him who said, this is speaking about God, and he's really quoting Old Testament passages there. We all know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Okay. We know that there is a God that's a jealous God, and he is the God who said, leave the vengeance up to me, and I will tend to it, but vengeance is mine, I will repay. But we know that the Lord said something else, and that is the Lord will judge his people. Now, the Hebrew writer is bringing that up because he's saying to Christians, he's telling them that you have to understand, we will be judged. If you follow his context there of Hebrews 10, which, by the way, comes right after he just got through saying, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and that, that, that's going to get us into a situation that we don't want to be in if we keep going that direction, that there won't be a, a sacrifice for that kind of sin if we go on rebelling against God that way. Well, here he says, we know that God said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And we know also that the Lord said, he will judge his people. And I understand that flies in the face of what many believe. They say, no, God will never judge his people. We've got a free card. That's what most will teach you. They will say, you'll get to judgment day and you won't even be judged. They'll just kind of give you a ticket straight into heaven. But that's not what that passage says. It says the Lord will judge his people. And Paul said all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So... I don't live every minute like in deadly fear of judgment. But judgment and understanding that I have a final accountability before God helps me every day to review my life, and I'm sure it does you too, to review my life and say, am I on the right course? And boy, if I get to ignoring that, a lot of times I get on the wrong course. 
it doesn't hurt to remember I'm accountable. It never hurts to remember I'll be called into question for how I've done, the preaching I've done, the work I've done, and the life that I've lived. This has to be remembered, and it has to re be remembered a lot. You know, the Lord gave you an example, and he talked about a man putting his servant in charge of his house. And then he went away. The master of the house went away. And the comparison is there to the fact that the Lord has given us responsibilities in this life and he's assigned us things to do. And now it seems as if, in other words, he's out of the picture. He's gone away. But he always told them he was coming back. And he talked about what happens if he comes back and finds that that servant has quit caring about his master's will and has started doing what he wants to do. He says, well, he casts him in the outer darkness. But he says, the blessed man is the one whom the master will come back and say, and see, that man's doing just what I left for him to be doing. And when Jesus, that's right in the midst of all of his parables that talk about being ready because he's like a thief in the night. And I think that's his secret to being ready. It's let's all the time stay in that situation where we're remembering my Lord will come again and my Lord is coming back and there is a day of accountability and I have to be prepared for that really every day of my life. I can't imagine it being any other way as a Christian than every day of so saying this could be the day or it could be the day that I leave this life in death and then after that comes judgment. I have to face that reality. You have to face that reality. And it's only wise if we do so. Well, thank you for listening to me today, both times. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your attitude and wanting to do what's right. We're going to sing our song to encourage us. If you need to come and be this hour baptized into Christ so that you might be pardoned from your sins and brought into the fellowship of the Lord's church and added to that church and we are ready to take responsibility in it. We encourage you to do just that. Let's be standing now.